All right, welcome back to the show, guys. We are so sick of modern bikes versus old bikes, and why is everyone missing the point with it? NorCal have started a new channel. Who are the gatekeepers of the content going online? And Cleat Float. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, Cleat Float. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. Cheap tires, expensive wheels, or cheap hubs, expensive skewers? <laughs> Which would you pick? <laughs> At what pressure? And what's the, what's the spoke count of the said wheels? Yeah. Are you alluding to something, Jesse? I am. Uh, All right. More videos comparing different types of equipment and we're going, we're going in circles. Can, I, I just, I think the thing that gets me, so G, they're good. They're actually good videos, entertaining videos. It's not just GCN that do them. Other channels are doing them. I but may have. You, you pretty much did yeah. the same thing yeah. with your titanium bike. Yeah. Um, like they're kind of entertaining, but they are. I feel like they're starting to be done in bad faith. Okay. They so the GCN one, for example, where they did they did 2013 bike versus 2023 bike, which is faster, and of course the 2023 bike was was a bit faster. The Canyon Aero, but we're at a point now where people actually want. I feel like people want an explanation. It's not good enough just to do the test and say, well, this bike was faster. Because like to me, the first thing, it's pretty obvious. The first thing is, well, are they using the same tires? No, they were using different. I think the 2013 bike was using an old GP4000. New one had the GP5000. Different wheels. They were on uh, alloy section wheels. The Canyon was the deep section wheels. So the, the, they're not, it's kind of, at this day and age, I feel like it's a bit disingenuous to just do test X versus test Y without making them comparable because the ta it just means the takeaways are to anyone experienced they like us we just go ah well you know it was probably just the wheels and the tires to the to, to someone new to cycling they're essentially getting a bit of bad information so okay my, my question i'm going to push back on you but firstly i want to ask you uh is there any place that you have seen content that you do think is trying to cover those bases is there an example? Well, there's, I mean, yeah, so there's, well, there's bicycle rolling resistance that, that gives, does, does objective testing of tire data. And the only, I think the only person on YouTube that actually tests stuff with the simple goal of finding what's fast is Peak Talk. So he does similar, similar tests, but he's actually giving you, t you actually end a Peak Talk video with <laughs> some knowledge that you didn't have before. Any of the other ones. I mean, your, your one was a bit different though because you weren't sort of testing which is faster. It was just, I mean, you're pretty upfront that it wasn't a scientific test. Well, let's, okay, okay. Here, and this is why I want to push back on you because for, for my personal experience doing it, I did it really for my own interest and I was surprised at the differences. But I also did it, and I'll be upfront about this, 95% of the reason I did it is I thought it was entertaining. Mm -hmm. And... I'm sorry, Jesse, but the, the reality, I think, even of those GCN videos, of all these tests, is it's a, it's a topic that seems to get hits, it gets views, and people, people love it. Do, do I honestly think, do I on, and this, this was almost backed up, right? This was back, so GCN followed this up with a poll that they did on the tech show, right? And the, the question was, what bike do you think is faster, a 2014 Pro Peloton bike or a 2023 Pro Peloton bike? Okay. And what's super interesting, well, 80%, 90%, whatever it was, voted for the 2023. Mm -hmm. So clearly everyone knows that the modern bikes are faster. But then if you look under the comment section of that 20, the comparison video that you're talking about, like... 90% of those comments are all people saying, oh, that S-Work, the Tarmac was such a better bike, blah, 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 blah. So it's like this complete disconnect between, and I honestly think it's the same people. It's mm -hmm. the same people. I, I, I almost think I'm one of them who, who has this sort of longing for what has been, but we're not under the illusion that actually what is faster, what is being produced now is faster. What is a bike? <laughs> This is where we're at. So they say 2013 thing versus 2023. Yep. Okay, which bike is faster? But does that mean, you know, like when they say bike, I think when people, when you say bike, people 
I mean, at least I subconsciously am pretty much thinking frame. Mm-hmm. But really, to compare apples and apples, you have to take into account the wheels and the tires. And I think that's where the disconnect is because you could be riding this year, you could be riding a 2015 frame, but you could put, I know we've gone down this before, you could put a new set of integrated aero handlebars on it. You could run a GP 5000s and a set of 60 mil wheels. And that's where I think you would probably still technically consider, say that's a 2013 bike. But he, he's, he, uh, uh, does anyone care? Like, do people really care about peak torques results? I mean, oh yeah, yeah. Well, in the, you know, in the grand scheme of things, I think. No, see, my 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 takeaway at the moment is that we don't actually care. We we kind of th- we want to get riled up about it. We think that there's this this hidden performance disadvantage that we're all suffering from. But what we're actually suffering from is the fact that the bikes got four times more expensive, and the bikes didn't get four times faster. And we're in this. I don't know. Again, I don't want to go too far back down <laughs> this but like we're right where we sit right now like right in the, the bike industry as it stands that the trickle down effect hasn't happened so we're sitting there with four times the expensive bikes as they were and we're not getting that performance advantage yet to to the trickle down bike mm. and that's i think ultimately what's pissing us off so much like i have an analogy i have this analogy written down here right and i don't know if this is this the summary um, in that GCN video, Simon did a summary at the end of it, which I thought was probably one of the best and most even summaries I've heard on a GCN video. He mm-hmm. was he was quite honest about it. And he used one about a knife, right, which was something like, you know, you can make a meal, you can make a really nice meal any way and it'll end up tasting the same. But if you used a blunt old knife to cut the tomatoes up. No, 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 yeah. no. The new bike isn't faster. It just had faster wheels and better tires. So no, 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 no. You don't, you, you don't, don't get, get credit yeah. for like this nice. Oh, but actually, it doesn't matter. Just enjoy your bike, you ride, even if it's a bit slower. It's not slower. It just has slower wheels and tires. Yep. Yep. So you don't get credit for a takeaway that sort of settles, keeps the peace. But it doesn't need that because the bike isn't. From what I can tell and from the, the actual data, the bike probably isn't... The, the bike, meaning the frame, probably isn't any slower. Well, the, yeah. I mean, the analogy that I'd written down, which a modern day 2023 America's Cup boat. So they're the sailing yachts, right? These things are just spaceships. They've got foils on them. They're trimarans. They look like they come out of the Jetsons. That's probably a reference and half the people watching this won't get... They are from the future. Compare that to a, an America's Cup boat that won in 1981 or 1982. What's super weird is that the bike that w- the the boat that won back in the 80s looks more like the boats that everyone sails now, right? Monohull, you know, big sort of mast, all the rest. Of, that's still the boat that everyone sails. Yet the the top end, the high performance guys use these incredible spaceship machines, and so. There's this kind of the disconnect in sailing, which doesn't, which no one seems to care about, which is like the pros essentially use this spaceship machine to to win their races, whereas like the everyday person, even like the performance everyday person, will just use a normal boat that was kind of used thirty years ago. Hmm. Where in cycling, you know, we see this sort of one little bit of tech that goes on a pro's bike now and we're like, I've got to have that on my bike. Like, but you're not a pro. Like, what are you talking about? So I just, I don't know. I find that is a weird place that this sport is as I well. still feel that exists in time trials though. I look at the pro time trial bikes and I go, that's that's light years ahead of what I had when I had a TT bike at Focus. Um, that's that's uh, That still exists. Probably more because of the cost of... A, a professional's time trial bike is probably you know, some most a lot of the parts you can't even really get like the custom molded extensions are quite niche harder to get and super expensive you know but well, that was kind of what 30, i was you know that's where you're getting like more like 30 plus grand as opposed to the you know you can buy an sl7 for 20. i the kind of was referencing that when we were talking about the prologue at the tour down under like that's what it missed 
not having the t- putting the logistics and all that. But that's what I from from me as a spectator missed is that kind of log on and see the wild new spaceship tech that's on the on the time trial bikes. I miss mm. that not having the just having the road bike triathlon. So my road bike try it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I don't think Simon does that many. Uh, GC, uh, host that many GCM videos anymore but it was like really entertaining to watch it was like you know he brought that the WD-40 to clean the bike I remember that like shut down cycling on the internet when they're like clean your lube your chain with WD-40 and everyone's like what that's still that five minute bike clean video if you have a look at their most watched videos is like in the top 10 videos they've ever done wow I just actually thought this might be an interesting way to, to kind of finish this chat like if you look at the content that they were making five, ten, ten years ago, right? Well, in that vicinity, like there was no this this narrative, this like old bike versus new bike stuff wasn't really on the channel. They weren't putting it, so there clearly wasn't like a a a market essentially for that content yet, hmm. because I suppose this big change maybe hadn't happened. Like all the content then was far more like training based and like what to eat on a ride and all that kind of stuff there was none of that real Mm. comparison of of equipment thing as much Mm. as as is now anyway guys let us know what you think is the is the old bike versus new bike content dead what is a bike these are the questions we're we're here to answer all right (laughs) i don't know if you've seen norcal cycling has a second channel now and it's doing something i always wanted to do which is like just training related content. So they're doing, he's got, is this pretty cool? So he, the channel's big enough where he has a guy that edits his, his editor is now making videos for the second channel and is the host of the vlog series. And it's a guy who, from what I can tell, wasn't really into cycling, didn't do much riding. He's now training and he's going to enter some crit races and it's following his progress. Um, so they're doing weekly vlogs there. For me, I, I'm actually quite enjoying it because I like vlogs. And this is separate, I suppose, to the training chat. But I like vlog content and vlogs are kind of dead on YouTube. So I sort of like the fact that that's being produced. I think like a training vlog series, we need more of. It's what the fitness industry does so well. So I think like being able to follow one for motivation is awesome and very entertaining. But a part of... So I think one of the reasons why they're doing the training thing is that NorCal is selling a a training course like a sort of a, an online program that goes into nutrition and training and things like that um, in a course and i am not sure where i sit on training courses okay okay yeah. interesting interesting all right so let's get into this. i wanted to chat about this tastefully because i'm obviously a coach so obviously like well you're just getting on there to to bash it because you're there's no interest. I'm not doing it. It's it's of no benefit to me to bash it for any reason. I, I just find it interesting because in my work, I see people that have tried online, the online training things or are sort of into the training side of things, but then end up coming to me because they get lost in, in a minefield. So where, where, do, where does a training or cycling course sit these days? Um, would, you, you, would you look into one? Would you use Absolutely. One? No, I genuinely, I genuinely would and I have recommended them to people in the past. And look, I suppose I, I will push back on you a bit. How do, I, how do I say this? Like you're a good coach, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff, but your service isn't for, for everyone. And I, I, know a few, I know a few of these people, right? And, I, and perfect example is I got a message from a friend of mine the other day and he's like, oh, um, I'm – going to do um the snowy event here in uh, so it's like a fondo event 120 130k right and they're going to do that any any training tips for me like and it's like this broad thing and he's even more broad right and his question then is should i just go and do like a couple an hour or two by myself and just ride real hard or should i just go out with group rides the whole time i did i just replied and said mate sign up to train a road or something like do a do a structured course. Go nuts, bro. So I agree. So I agree, but that's not what these things are, right? Okay. So let me let so these sit in the middle ground. You've got online training platforms, training plans, if you want to call them, like trainer road and stuff. Then you've got something like I do, which is coaching. These sit in the middle ground where they're not 
Okay, there might be pl plans that are available in them, but they're essentially courses to teach people how to manage their own training and manage their own nutrition and things like that. And I think these this weird middle ground where it's not, you're sort of involved in the training process, but it's not telling you what to do. I always think these just generate people with more, they generate more questions than they answer for a lot of people. So they they provide information. So people kind of, it's like Dunning-Kruger effect sort of thing almost in a way. It's kind of like, they're giving people a certain amount of information so they feel like they can be in control of their own training. But that's never really the case because you're always second guessing. Even someone who's an experienced coach, like even when I do my own training, I still have to go to Dan. I'm like, oh, can you, you know, what do you think about this? Can you double check this? Because you need a second opinion on stuff. And I, f I feel like a lot of these courses, um, you know, the NorCal one isn't, now I've, I haven't done it. So I'm just sort of based on what I can see. But whether it's that or I know the um, there's other ones online that, that do it, you kind of end up at the end of it probably with someone who isn't experienced enough to schedule their own training, but probably has a bit too much knowledge to feel like they want to go and do a trainer road. And then mm. they just end up in a middle ground. That's, that's an interesting that's space. Okay, so yeah. you're, you're almost, the, the theory therefore is to try and empower the athlete. So the solution that I have, if, if you can't afford coaching or you're just not interested in having a, a private coach, like the online training platforms are pretty good. Like Trainer Road, it might be, uh, the only problem is it might be hard to follow if you're not into that following super structured training. But like the actual training's pretty good. So I would recommend, and I recommend sometimes to people that come to me, I say, just do a training, follow the training plan. Like you'll probably get better. And that way you can kind of just switch off your brain a bit and stop at, and just have faith that the, the training platform and system is good and just follow it. And mm. put your focus more into you actually executing your training well and your recovery and, and your lifestyle and things like that to get more out of the training as opposed to spending. You know, honestly, people would spend, like, if you're doing your own training, could easily spend a, a couple hours a day milling it over and should I do this workout or that workout? And it's not, I don't think it's a good space to end no, up No, I, I agree. But there's, there's people out there who want to do that. And, mm. and okay, so the reason I say that is I've listened to some of this Trainer train Road podcast stuff and some of the questions that come in from, from users of the platform are like, holy hell, like the depth, the analysis, the, 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 your information that you seem to already know about your own training and what, what route to take it. There's clearly like this level of person, and I'm sure you probably see them at your end who are giving you more feedback than you can, can deal with half the time. Maybe that is the person who's who's going to to benefit from this. I, I would probably say that it is a a much smaller sort of percentage of people, but it always blows my mind, mate. Like when you listen to the Trainer Road podcast, the questions that come in, and you're like, "Is that a question or <laughs> just a really detailed?" <laughs> statement? That was funny. Like we uh, we yeah, I think we chat about this, and you were like, "I don't even understand the terminology in the question." The person obviously has. A level of knowledge which is far above the like yeah almost at a level of someone who's done a sports science degree but you know that's that person still has a thousand questions and it's it's an interesting yeah it's an interesting space but yeah clearly like you know taking it back to the channel so yeah it's good i think they've clearly got a product to sell which is appealing to people which is good because we get free good motivating training content out of that second channel and so let us know guys your thoughts this sort of second tier mid-tier type of coaching course where does it sit with with you and the norcal cycling channel the second part of it are you enjoying it what do you think once again jesse i think we are going to prove ourselves as not the place to go for your daily recap of world tour cycling though we do Pay some attention to it. But we're going to take a different angle at this. Well, at least I want to today. So the, the season's kind of starting out and I'm already kind of bored. I'm kind of bored of a few talking points. And maybe this just comes back to like the way the media deals with like pro cycling or whatever. But I just find – so there's talking points, there's narratives that I'm already like I know this is going to play out all year and I'm bored of it. The first one is the whole Julian Alaphilippe, Willy won't he re-sign at Quickstep. It's not that I don't care. It's just that the way this is going to be drummed up as interesting, 
it's we're going to be looking into you know what's his name what's the friggin Lefevre. Lefevre's every tweet or does he tweet or you know every interview that he does or article that he writes oh this is a dig at him that's a dig at him no that's actually him uh trying to um, inspire his superstar to do better and and then there's going to be the whole thing I guarantee it's probably already out there there's going to be this whole thing of like oh but he wants to be on a French team and then the French are going to be wanting him and then there's going to be like <laughs> an article in Le Keep and it's going to be oh I want to be French I yeah it's going to play out I'm over it I'm not interested the second one the second one I'm I'm already I'm already bored of we're going to have this whole okay here we are. We're gonna, I'm getting into All right. it. All right. um, we're going to have this whole <laughs> early season narrative of there's a level playing field, right? You're going <sighs> to see this play out. It's going to be because because here's what's going to happen. You're going to have the 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 middle middle rung teams are going to do well early, and we're going to have this whole line of stuff about oh, the, the level playing field and then we're going to pretend to sort of delve into it's because of the equipment or it's because um, training's better. And then there's going to be this whole other thing that will play out, which will be racing is too hard, too early. Guys aren't warming into the season like back in the old days. And then there's going to be this whole other thing that will be, oh, uh, well, y- you can't have it both ways. You can't have, you know exciting racing and on this on the same spectrum have guys easing their way into the season it's just not going to play out that way they're obvious boring talking points that i don't care about i know they're going to play out jesse help me out <laughs> dig me out of this, this I, can't, hole. I can't dig you out i'm just going to have to bury you in dirt because <laughs> i find maybe maybe it's because pro cycling is small i'll go on twitter i'll see i'll listen to lantern rouge podcast on it i'll see what benji's tweeted about it and 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 i'll be that's pretty much it that's end of the interest i don't want to hear like six different podcasts bang on about it it's why we don't really cover much of it we'll cover something interesting maybe on the periphery that other people don't speak about but that's about it like you were saying as well a a, a topic we could do or chat about is kind of like your fantasy team like pick your your, your top eight sort of go to team go. Yep. um Yep. And I was like... LeBron versus MJ. And you were like, oh, because like other sports it's in basketball, it's like super entertaining on the on their types of shows. I'm like, I don't think it works for cycling. Or at least I wouldn't find it entertaining. It wouldn't be a segment of a podcast I'd want to listen and to. And why is that? Is it because is it because we... the I mean, I thought about this and I'm like, is it because the races are so... Like, ha, what, what are we picking? Are we picking a Grand Tour team? Then do you, are you just picking a team that's like all around the one guy anyway or is that the problem or is it that we're not actually that invested and this is what i think i think mm-hmm. we're not actually that invested sorry in the riders like i mean mm. i i am invested in like one rider in the pro peloton because i have an actual like relation personal relationship with them everyone else i'm just like cool yeah Oh, that's cool. He won. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's cool. He won. It's not like, I don't know. I just don't feel like I, I root for someone. I root for a team. Like maybe, is that it? Although I kind of root for someone. Like watching Arno De Lee coming, rising through the ranks, like destroying people in sprints, I find very entertaining. But I wouldn't want to hear someone talk about him, about picking him for a fantasy team. I, I, yeah. The way maybe that we consume pro cycling, and this is what I find interesting, right? So, Maybe that needs to change. And maybe actually the way you're consuming pro cycling is the future. Like, so um, the NBA, right? So the NBA, what a lot of NBA is now being consumed on is, is like TikTok, Instagram Reels, Twitter. Like people, people are just sharing that moment, right? That dunk. You don't watch the game. Mm-hmm. It's like that moment of the game that goes viral is sort of the bit that you bit that you watch so just like you logging into seeing you know what happened last night for us in the in the race is that little snippet that little bit that little interesting maybe that's that's the future of the sport Mm, i can see that yeah if you've watched an the last hour and a half of a race you don't really then want to go listen to an hour podcast about it unless it's the tour de france um maybe is so that's definitely a thing maybe our uh 
the people talking about it just aren't very entertaining. I pretty much only watch Lantern Rouge and, and, and Lance on the move when the, when, he, when the two is on. The other stuff is crap. Are we going to go for this? Go on. Are we going to go for this, Jesse? Yeah. All right. Let's go. This is what, how many episodes have we done? <laughs> anyway, this is our last episode. We'd just like to <laughs> congratulate everyone. Okay. I don't disagree with you. So, and, and, oh, Chris, be careful. All right. One of my issues is that there hasn't been a new generation come into the content that's been made and, and in the mainstream. You know, the guys, um, will I? Go on, I'll yeah. back you up. Okay. I'll back no, you up. I don't want you come on, I want <laughs> put you your to armor dis- on. I want you to disagree with me. Um, the, the, people, the people who are in the mainstream media mo- majority-wise are the people who came up 20, 30 years ago essentially like on the coattails of the growth of the sport around Lance, right? Especially in English-speaking media, okay? So most of it came up through that, that period when the sport exploded. And, and here in Australia, you saw a presenter on SBS, Mike Tomolaris, who, who was there at the beginning, and that was almost what made him the, the, the person on cycling because he was there at the beginning, mm. okay? Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Tomo is not a great example because he's sort of moved moved on since. But that generation is still there, and I kind of feel like they they that hasn't not that they're not doing a good job. It's just that there hasn't been a new influx yet of come through and and take over that that place. So maybe that the and Lantern Rouge and that that growth I think has been a, a great test case for how new people come into the sport because you're looking at two guys, and this is what I love about these guys, two guys who weren't pros. I love it. They're just friggin' fans. Mm -hmm. And for me, that is like what we need. Because as well, like we saw um, with some of the layoffs in the, the, the cycling tips layoffs and some of the journalists losing their jobs and like one of the podcasts that stuck came up from that, this placeholders podcast, which I listened to an episode of and they covered a lot of, they they covered quite a lot of um, pro cycling topics, and I found it quite boring, to be honest. It's it's not something I would listen to. Pretty much the only reason I listened to it was firstly I recognised the names that were hosting the podcast from from the from cycling tips like Kaylee Fretz and stuff, and then the voices Cosmo Catalano from How the Race Was Won, and it's like that was what an awesome thing that was when it was out. Oh man! And now he doesn't. From what I can tell, doesn't do it anymore. Maybe that's why we're, you know, we're pre- not interested in hearing, you know, in just spending hours and hours on pro cycling stuff because we just get bored of it so quick because there's not that much content. I do want to bring this back always to like other sports and other bits of content, but I, I do I listen to and watch a lot of other sports stuff. And like what seems to be missing, and maybe, maybe this isn't necessarily what you were talking about, but what seems to be missing with it is like, how often do you hear, like on any cycling content, people like genuinely disagreeing with each other and having like arguments about a topic on on these sort of platforms? They just don't happen. They happen in the comments section, right? Mm-hmm. Like you get into a comments, bang, away goes the, the arguments, <laughs> right? But like all these like shows that I watch, right, it's like you pretty much just pit two people up against each other, you know, your favourite is Michael Jordan, your favourite's LeBron, go. And it just turns into like this shouting match. Like I haven't listened to this podcast that you were talking about, but like I guarantee you that there's not that much sort of, no, I totally disagree with you. And that that's to me what is completely missing from this sort of space. That, that probably that's just the maturity of the, yeah, the maturity of the whole thing. Maybe in, in 20 years It'll get there. Is it the people that are there? Because I come back to this thing of like the people that were there 20 years ago that are essentially like the gatekeepers to this this medium now. Like, okay, guys like Lantern Rouge have managed to get past it. But, you know, they, they were. They, we, you couldn't get YouTube stuff on the mainstream media. Anyway, we've talked about that mm. in the past. Mm. But I felt like there's been like these gatekeepers that have stopped you getting past it. And maybe that's going to change. And... Maybe what's changed it outside, is that the outside media or whatever that is, outside magazine? Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe those changes, you know, short term really sucks. Don't, don't get me wrong. 
But like long term, we might see some changes and well, the gatekeepers might be pissed off. Speaking of that, I think I, I agree. Um, at, well, you can, they're going to know because you look at the views that like a Lantern Rouge gets versus what some generic cycling podcast, it's smoke blows it out of the water. So mm. they're going to eventually be like, we've got to do something different because it's not whatever they're doing. That's not monetizable to any meaningful way because it just doesn't get the viewership. But in terms of that, like the outside media thing, I think there's a change coming because that article that came out oh, Jesus. and now i don't necessarily agree but they did a, an, an article on the whole um mo wilson the murder of mo wilson it was it was like a book I, I only got through the first section um pretty negative feedback and i thought it was weird basically the first section was this weird dramatization almost glorified story it's about like netflix how screenplay. she was murdered yeah i was like what am i reading it was kind of disgusting to read but that got through the edit the editors and was posted and if that's kind of not that i agreed with that but if that's the stuff that's going to be getting through maybe we'll actually get something that's interesting don't don't get us wrong don't don't drop in the comments and say that we uh thought that, that article was good by no imagination did we think that was good but i think what jesse is pointing out is that it was different you know and uh, maybe there is maybe there is a bit of a, a shift happening there but jesus yeah that was that was something else. Having said all this about the the content stuff, I think what's going to be super interesting will be the the Netflix Drive to Survive thing from last year's tour, which will eventually come out. If I hope it's better than that Yumbo Visma thing. That was abysmal. I'm sorry. Like, could you put another cliche into that? The Plan B thing. Did you see any of that? But it wasn't. Oh, is that on YouTube? Was that on YouTube? It's, it, there's a yeah. There's a YouTube version. Okay. Of it. Right. Yeah. It was, there was no, there's no engagement to it. It's just like that classic, oh, we we were down and out. So let's turn it round, guys. <laughs> Insert footage of like montage -y hard stuff happening and then some celebration. It was just like, give me a break. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know where this topic started. I think it was me whinging about talking points. But guys, let us know. I think we covered a heap in that. Uh, but yeah, lots, lots to, lots to debate. Drop us your thoughts down below, hey. So I know we've discussed engaging podcast topics, but I want to carry on and really go down the entertainment route and just talk about cleat float. So, <laughs> this is just, just a quick insight. This is normally the bantery bit that shit podcasts do at the beginning of the show. You've got to normally put up with five minutes of this shit banter. And then you get to the topic. Just a quick FYI, you will never get that here. All right, your shit banter this is This is the 30-minute in special. So, yes. right. <laughs> when you set up your cleats, mm -hmm. so yes. a cleat has a, like, if you're on a grey look cleats or the yellow shimano, you've got four degrees of float. Mm -hmm. When you set your cleats up, do you set them up so they're in the middle? So when your foot's straight, it can move inwards and outwards? Or do you set it up so that while you're pedaling, you're up against the limit of the float. The answer to what I do is I set it up to the limit of where I can go in. Mm -hmm. So I'm constantly pedaling at the point where I'm on the innermost limit. I do the exact same thing. And I've, I went through like a weird existential crisis about the whole thing because I felt like I was the only person that ever had had these thoughts because I've never heard anyone talk about it because I always thought the, the, the sort of the classic thing is you just set them up so your feet are straight but that never worked for me because my heels always want to come in so if I set them up straight my heels are, and ankles are rubbing the cranks so I naturally just set them up like that and I went for a bike fit with Tom Petty at Embassy and he was like you know you should just run zero float cleats and I was like oh wow <laughs> mind blown so yeah so I've moved to zero float cleats because I never use that outside angle of the float. So I always thought, and I have no history of any knowledge in this, but I always thought that the benefit of the float was not just necessarily at the top of the pedal, it was also at the sort of top, like the when you're at the it cranks up. Mm -hmm. So maybe that your your knee or whatever was given some flexibility as it came over the top of the pedal stroke potentially maybe mm -hmm. i don't know but i'm the same as you like if i if so if i went and set my float up 
in the in the middle and had like um, the innermost limit be like literally on the crank, I would be pedaling on the crank. Yeah, I, my le- my heels would just keep going in until someone said stop. Mm. Yeah, and that's why I never quite understand. I mean, maybe there's people that are so balanced that they can just ride in the middle of the float. But yeah, I I, I never felt like from memory. I ever used any of that float anyway. And I'm interested to know what other people do because you're the only person I've asked <laughs> and you were the same as me. And I tried to, I did a, you know, those community posts on YouTube. I did one of those trying to ask. I feel like people didn't understand what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> so let's, let us know comments because I feel like there's a big group of people that use float in their cleats that probably don't need it. Spoiler alert, I've got some shoe reviews coming. Ooh. All right. So I've, I don't know whether shoes feel different, like on your feet, okay, how they fit on your, on your feet, that's a clear difference. Like the, the way a Bont fits, the way a Nimble fits, the way a Shimano fits, the way the Raffers fit, they feel different on your feet, the way they shape around your foot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But like does it actually matter? And this is sort of what I've been thinking a bit about. Like, really, does it matter? Because okay, let's say all the different shoes are relatively kind of comfortable. Does, does, is there anything in the build here that's affecting my pedaling? You've never used an entry-level shoe. I've used an entry-level shoe and it sucks. I've had, like, you get hot foot, pins and needles. It's, cr- it's really bad. So... I think you're lucky that you've, in probably the last 10 years or five years, have only used good shoes. So, yes, there are definitely such a thing as bad shoes. Don't disagree. Okay. Well, I'm not, I'm not talking about the difference between like a shit entry level shoe and a premium. I'm talking about at the, at the, all the entry levels or all the premiums, is there actually a difference with them? Because like I have sat in a, I've sat in a bike shop and listened to people come in and out and saying, I hate shoe X. I love shoe Y. Both both shoes are in five hundred dollars plus, and the person is not necessarily talking about the fit of the shoe. Then their their feet fit in them fine. It seems to be a performance thing. They mm-hmm. seem to be able to. There is. Okay. There definitely is. You, I think again. I think you're lucky that you must have pretty generic feet. For me, like even the Shimano ones I used. They didn't have as good ankle support as the Rafa shoes. So when I would pedal, my ankles would sort of f- collapse on the insole. And I, is that making a performance difference? I don't know. I didn't like that feeling. It's why I like the Rafa shoes and the Bonds because the insole's stiffer and it's better to push against. So for me, yes, even two top of the line shoes can be night and day. Interesting. And then I wonder if it's different. Like, is that support that you feel across... Okay, you you mentioned the Bont and the Rafa shoes are better for you. I wonder when there, whether there is someone out there who's like, oh, the, the, that support's terrible for me and I much prefer the Shimano. Like, that's... Because I, I actually do think there is a difference. I genuinely do. I've flipped around these sort of four different shoes recently, which has been a friggin' nightmare, I might add. But, yeah, I do actually feel like I get sore in certain places not in my feet nothing to do with my feet but just in terms of like the way i pedal across the shoes and i don't know what it is like they're all nice they've got carbon soles and mm. things so yeah yeah different stiffness properties if so but the funny thing is if you ask dan about this because i had this chat with him years ago when I was used to, she was like oh i don't like the shimano shoes because my ankle collapses and it comes back to people that use the orthotics, the custom orthotics. And the, the sales point is it has more support and then so your more stability through your foot. And Dan, I'm going to quote him here or paraphrase. He says, well, actually, from a biomechanics point of view or physiology point of view, it actually doesn't matter if your foot's not as stable. He, he, he reckons if your ankle collapses it in, it's not really going to make a difference to your power output, your performance. It's more of just a personal preference kind of thing, which I didn't agree with. I, I <laughs> didn't like that feeling at all. But in terms of speed and power output, it might not, act, I don't actually, I don't know the answer, but it may not, according to him, may not make much of a difference. Yeah, I mean, obviously I'm trying to do these shoe reviews and like I talk about the fit, I talk about like the weight, I talk about keeping them clean, I'm talking about all this stuff. 
But then there's this other thing. It's like trying to measure acceleration or something on a bike. I'm like, there is another difference here, but mm. I have no idea how to articulate this mm. because it's, maybe it's different for me, it's different for the other person, but like I do feel different pedaling with different shoes. And then there's the laces thing across all some of the laces stuff with the bow. The bo- and mm. I'm like, I look at T- Tadej Pagacha and I'm like, how are you doing this? Like at a pure perform, like the top end pure performance level, how is he racing with laces? It, may, it makes no sense to me. Like, to be on a laced shoe going into the sprint at the end of a classic race and not being able to tighten your boas, that's a, that's a, that's surely that's a performance difference, having your foot sort of bounce around a little bit in the sprint. But maybe it isn't. And that's, that's, this, is, this is where... <laughs> maybe it, this it is, isn't. Maybe Dan's right. Yeah. This is where it kind of all started for me because I'm like, maybe it's totally in my head. Like this... this because obviously it's like, it's like this curve, right? It's like the more comfortable the shoe gets, the, the you sort of feel like the less performance orientated it's going to be. Like you step into a Bont shoe and it's like, oh, okay, right. So this is, this is a race shoe. Like it's going to rip my frigging upper of my feet off, <laughs> but, you know, I'm not losing any power here. And then you step into like the DMT, KMT, I think it's called, whatever it is, KMR maybe, the one that he uses. And it's like, oh, this is a pillow. But surely it's not going to be faster. I don't know. I just... Oh, jeez. I'm glad not to be down that rabbit oh, hole I'm with down you. There. Yeah. yeah, I'm down there. <laughs> <laughs> so give me a metric, people. Give me a metric to, to include in a shoe review that in some way it's like a, I don't know, the Miller. Mm. The Miller factor. The Miller factor. All right. Where do you set up your float and... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I'll just leave that. Uh, mid-pod bants. Mid-pod bants. So that's another one in the books, guys. Make sure to check out some of our older videos. I'll put those links down below. If you're on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe to the channel. And if you are listening to us on a podcast player, hit a five-star review and we'll do a review. That'd be super nice. Alrighty, guys, we'll see you next week. Thank you.